yeah, during Christmas, it was, uh, it was difficult. There was like, so, so little things a guy could do and get out and like the kids were kind of getting cabin fever. So <laughs> it was, I don't know how Christmas was for you guys, but yeah, it was cold. It was a cold Christmas. It was, yeah, it was definitely similar for us. Um, I think like um, over this winter, I've gotten acquainted with just braving the cold. And I think uh, my tolerance has really increased because previously I would have assumed minus 15 or minus 20 is cold. But now I'm like, oh, it's just another day <laughs> this winter. <laughs> Nothing to see here. Yeah, it's funny. I remember growing up having usually a week of above minus 40, but yeah, it's been, okay, you, you get spoiled and yeah, I agree that 20 was cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Morning, Jesse. Morning, everyone. It's David. Morning, hey, everyone. Hey, morning, Jess. I just, just quickly wanted to say hello to everyone because uh, I, I sort of heard about this through a colleague. I'm actually the product manager for Service Assist. So if oh, I get my face there out there. So oh, wonderful. Yeah, so if you've got any questions, just feel free to, to copy me in. Awesome. No, it's great. great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I was planning on giving a little bit of intro to Service Assist before I launch into our actual use case. So I hope I don't misrepresent anything, uh, <laughs> but uh, I feel like uh, we have wor worked with it close enough that um, that should not be a problem today. I'm sure it'll yeah. be fine. <laughs> Danya, hi, it's Elisa. I'm on the line too. So hi, Elisa. I know you'll do a great job, but between James and I, there's questions. <laughs> Thank you. Let us know. Hello. 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 Hello, Vinod from India. Hi. New to this group and attending first time. Good morning. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Oh, actually, I am attending first time this meeting. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks for joining. There's a, uh, yeah, there's a, uh, it's getting to be a pretty big group. I think we're up to about 154 people already. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah and this, I think around 50 should be joining us here today, but we'll probably get started and record the session and uh, whoever joins, joins. Um, so, um, so yeah, I guess we'll, we'll get kick it off. So, um, you know, thank, thanks so much for everyone for attending, um, both both on, on the call here and certainly attending the, the call as we as a, whenever it gets posted to YouTube. Um, this session is uh, really the the uh, second uh, Western Canada RPA user group um, uh, presentation. Um, today we've got uh, a great speaker. I'm super excited to to uh, see the presentation on Service Assist. Um, and um, uh, one quick point before uh, I forget is that if you're interested in speaking in March, um, send me an email at uh, jesse, J-E-S-S-E dot tut um, at A-H-S dot C-A, uh, T-U-T-T. -T. Uh, we are certainly always looking for speakers for March and, uh, and so on. Um, so now, now let's, uh, well, let's get things rolling. Um, so uh, Jenya uh, is a, a senior engagement uh, manager at uh, Bernie Group, and uh, she's got a PhD um, and, uh, from U of T. Uh, with a focus on, on healthcare process modeling and optimization. Moved here from Canada, uh, or to Canada from Russia when she was 15, lives in Toronto with her husband and uh, a couple of cats and a dog. And uh, uh, she played tennis competitively when she was young, which is interesting, and uh, loves uh, running and, and skiing. Um, in her spare time, she writes and she has a poem, a book of poems. She's done a whole bunch of sci fi, um, you know, short stories and that's been published in a variety of journals. And uh, she's working on her first novel, which is actually pretty exciting. So um, before we get to Jenya, I want to introduce uh, Dave uh, Bernie, who founded the, uh, the, the Bernie Group, uh, to share a, bit, a, a background on, on, uh, on the organization. Dave. Hey, Jesse. How are you? And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we're, we're excited to be here and talk about a, a specific use case that we uh, implemented with one of our clients. Um, one of the largest telcos in Canada. And the thing that we'll talk about, which is I think will be of interest <clears throat> for, um, for everyone on the call is uh, that it was in the contact center. <clears throat> Traditionally, um, RPA has been um, uh, focused on back office automation. And um, because 
the ability to automate live while someone's on the phone has been difficult. New innovations um, have really changed that and we leveraged uh, Blue Prism Service Assist in order to do that um, with this large telco. And we'll walk through that case study and I think it will be a, a, a good use case um, for people to, uh, to really understand. Um, how it works and opens up some opportunities for everyone in thinking about different ways to run their contact center and how to how to automate it. So I think we had a um, presentation uh, that we were going to go through. Jesse, I will need uh, you will need to release the screen in order for me to screen oh, share it. There we go. So yeah. much. My apologies. <laughs> no worries. Sure. And um, are you guys able to see my screen? Yeah, for sure. And yeah. I am tragically on a wrong slide, but uh, I think we're happy to begin our presentation. Um, so in general, four topics to cover today. Uh, Dave gave a, a very quick Bernie Group introduction already, but we'll go through a couple more slides on what we do um, at our organization. Uh, then we did want to talk about uh, service assist and contact center automation in general, and then we will actually launch um, into discussing our large Canadian telecommun telecommunications company use case, and we will have some time today for Q&A as well. Uh, Dave, do you want to take a couple of more slides on what we do as Bernie Group? Sure. I, I won't spend too much time on this. I know you're more interested in... Um, the use case itself. Um, needless to say, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to, uh, to Jenya or myself. Um, we're a management consulting firm. We're based in Toronto. Um, I founded Burning Group after having worked at McKinsey & Company for eight years. And um, our focus is really um, around enabling our clients yeah. to embrace automation and um, we've uh, got great expertise in helping clients to build out uh, an automation center of excellence, um, as well as um, we can help with the implementation as well of um, building out a roadmap and a strategy and bringing automation to life. And broader than just RPA, looking at things such as OCR, digitization, process mining, and artificial intelligence. So Burning Group really is about bringing together management consulting of what would traditionally be done and technology. And so thinking about how to really leverage technology to enhance the way that you operate. You can see a sample of our clients uh, on the bottom of the page there. In terms of our partnerships and what we can bring to the table, you know, we have broad partnerships across intelligent automation, document understanding and digitization, uh, AI and other technologies and capabilities. So we view ourselves as being uh, our clients' representative to think about what's best for them and how can they really enable technology to drive performance improvements. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Do you want me to take um, a little bit um, the topic of contact center um, and our expertise? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I think I just kind of wanted to move a little bit into speaking about what differentiates us and why we're interested in um, the implementation of automation contact center environment. So um, Bernie Group uh, has been doing RPA for quite a few years. Uh, we were the North, first North American consulting firm with an RPA practice. Uh, we also are first North American consulting firm to implement large scale contact center automation project uh, with a leading Canadian telecommunications provider, and that's uh, what we will discuss today. Um, and we have delivered large-scale automation transformation and centers of excellence across various uh, industries. And as Dave, of course, uh, mentioned already, we are uh, vendor agnostic. We're certified with multiple RPA vendors. Um, and of course, um, we work very, very closely uh, with uh, Service Assist and Blue Prism as well. And uh, we do uh, have uh, 25, over 25 years of combined uh, corporate contact center leadership and consulting experience. Um, if you do have any questions about our expertise or kind of uh, would like to get in touch, again, as Dave said, you can uh, reach out uh, to us at the end of the presentation. Uh, we're happy to chat um, about what we do. 
Um, a little bit notably for some of the results we have achieved is we have uh, winner of 2018 Blue Prism World Robotic Operating Model Excellence Awards that was went to one of our clients to whom we helped set up their center of excellence. Um, and uh, last year, we won Blue Prism Partner Excellence Awards for regional client business impact uh, in the Americans, in the Americas. As well as we do have, we host webinars uh, and do provide thought leadership in uh, automation topics, uh, whether it's uh, insurance operations, contact center, and um, other topics as well. Um, I did want to spend some time uh, kind of like setting the stage and discussing benefits of automation and contact center. Um, I assume that a lot of you at this point are, of course, already sold on, on RPA and what in general it can provide uh, to more back office environments. Uh, but we did want to put some thought uh, to what makes contact center different and um, what can automation bring specific uh, to contact centers? And I think before I even get there, um, we've spent years with our clients asking whether or not um, they can automate in their contact centers. And often the answer was, well, not so much or really limited use cases or things that can be fire and forget processes uh, and not something enterprise scale and really, really meaty. And in recent years, it has absolutely changed with products like Service Assist. So um, this is our list, um, the definitive most exhaustive list of the benefits of contact center automation. So first of all, um, the nature of work at contact center is that of very high volume time consuming tasks. So um, what automation can do is reduce or eliminate time spent on these high volume and time consuming tasks. Uh, digital assistant or digital workers can complete simple repetitive tasks during or after the calls, freeing up frontline employees to focus on more value added activities. Second one is automating customer validation. That is really big topic in contact center. Uh, so an example of that uh, digital assistance that can uh, validate customers before even connecting to a live uh, frontline employee. And that can be done via IVR integration or um, other options as well. Third one would be optimizing FAQ access. So that's uh, a situation you can, where you can rapidly identify the most relevant FAQs for customer inquiries, helping frontline employees to answer questions better and more quickly. Uh, fourth one is automating after call work. So typically a contact center frontline employee um, after wrapping up their uh, call with a customer has to do quite a bit of um, after work call, taking notes, uh, sending queries to back office, et, et cetera. And because uh, RPA is really, really good at automating tasks that integrate with multiple systems, this is a perfect uh, scenario to automate. And this allow, what this does to frontline employees is allows them to spend more time with their customers, which is very, very beneficial uh, as well. Um, fifth one is reducing and eliminating switching between screens and systems. So that's an example where contact center automation can design, uh, can allow the design of a unified desktop uh, and eliminating the need for frontline employees to switch between different systems and screen. Six one is increasing the speed of retrieving information. So um, contact center and digital workers are built uh, to process things very, very fast. So they can retrieve information much faster than frontline employees can, and they speed up access to uh, all aspects of call resolution. Seventh one is providing 360 degree view of the customer. Uh, so uh, that what that is, is pulling data really, really quickly from multiple systems to give a dashboard of everything related uh, to a particular class, uh, customer that can be shared with frontline employees. And typically frontline employees uh, would have to manually navigate all these systems to uh, get to that 360 degree view. Uh, next one is seamlessly integrate between systems. So again, um, as a typical RPA would, um, you can integrate between systems, pre-populate information from multiple systems into a unified desktop, reducing the time spent waiting for screens and re for refreshing and searching for information. Uh, ninth one on my list is fully automate specific call types. Um, and that is really, really exciting uh, to see. And we'll actually, we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, this in our use case. But uh, if you combine uh, contact center automation with other contact center tools, such as IVR and chatbots, 
Some of the customer queries can be completely resolved without even speaking to the customer, which saves a lot of time. Customer would absolutely love uh, to have their queries automatically and quickly resolved. Um, the next one on my list, uh, routing calls more effectively. So that is evaluating initial customer responses from an IVR or a chatbot while considering customer profile information to route them to the most appropriate queue or frontline employee. And I've got two more on my list. So uh, 11th, and um, it's, of course, a no-brainer is eliminating um, errors, and that's uh, bread and butter of RPA in general. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, digital workers do not make uh, typing mistakes, or uh, they can eliminate steps from process, uh, and uh, they will consistently execute the task time after time. And finally, really important is accelerating and improving decision making. So uh, that is a situation where a digital worker can provide recommendations to frontline employees to facilitate quicker decisions based on a comprehensive view of all available information. I'm so that's in general what uh, benefits of contact um, in, uh, automation are. And um, I kind of like wanted uh, to give a little bit more examples of what contact center operations can look like if you implement um, automation there. Uh, typically what happens uh, in today's um, contact center is a customer calls in, um, usually at this point there is an IVR component, um, then you're connected to an agent and during a call, a frontline employee will have to navigate countless numbers of systems trying to capture um, the customer query properly, look up information on the fly, uh, do a lot of swivel chair activities, often send queries to back office in some situations, uh, hoping to get the query right away, but often it's not possible. So a query will be sent and the call is closed without being fully resolved. So it can be a really, of course, stressful, uh, high pressure, high volume environment. And after implementation of contact center, what you can do is, first of all, if a digital worker integrates with IVR chatbot, there, um, there are benefits to reap as I discussed earlier, but a bot will work in parallel with the contact center employees to uh, search information, populate information, pre-populate information, uh, send queries uh, to back office, um, and complete full tasks while uh, the agent is on the call and is able to actually complete their script and complete, complete um, the customer query. So there is three areas of benefits and uh, they are separated into a pre-call, during call benefits, and of course, uh, post-call. So really a lot of opportunities to change um, how contact center or frontline employees perform their tasks. One of the exciting uh, solutions that we've worked with with clients is um, as people access the IVR or the chatbot or even through, the, through a website, you can resolve customer queries without ever going to an agent. And so that can be um, a, a great win for both customers who can very quickly and easily get their question resolved. Maybe it's an address change and uh, it's a great win for the organization as that, the customer's happy and we actually don't have to engage um, our frontline employees um, on some of these more menial tasks. And so they can focus on some of the more challenging queries uh, that come in from customers. Thanks, Dave. And uh, now just kind of like to further set, set the stage. So contact center automation tool that we worked um, uh, on the particular use case that we'll be discussing very, very shortly, I promise you, is uh, Blue Prism Service Assist product. So what that is, it's a automation layer inside your contact center e ecosystem. And Service Assist um, is a product that is built specifically for contact centers and all of its features that make traditional RPA not so great uh, of an option in that uh, environment. So. Um, quite a few things to call out here in terms of what services this can do, but it can provide integrated call scripting, asynchronous work and pop-ups, uh, digital works can work alongside with agents. Importantly, because the nature of contact centers SLAs are near instantaneous, 
uh, this is what Blue Prism Service Assist excels at and is built for. So it's built for uh, a lot of parallel processing, being able to chunk your processes and processing parts of requests uh, all simultaneously. Um, the way that the bots are, are designed is that they swarm and are able to perform queries much, much quicker than uh, what you would usually be used to, like the typical process where uh, you send your queries to a queue, the bot processes them and they come back. Uh, the response time in AHT of that, of course, can be really value, uh, varied uh, in traditional scenarios. And here um, in contact center, if you really want to make sure that uh, potentially a lot of volume can be processed all at the same time and near instantaneously. So there's quite a few things on this slide and uh, obviously I would be happy to provide it afterwards. And um, I'm certain that uh, everyone who joined this call who's uh, on the Blue Prison Services Assist team uh, can provide you much more educational materials on what it can do. But I think it will be better if I um, just showcase how we actually implemented it uh, with our clients. So I am going to be getting into it. Um, and one final thing about Service Assist um, that we found really helpful for this client in particular is um, the fact that it can integrate uh, with the existing tools really, really easily. Um, here are five options of how to integrate. Uh, so it's with existing screens, but using robot integration new services to screens, but with the same look and feel of the current client applications. You can embed a unified desktop. You can call up services to screens. And of course, finally, it's a digital self-service updating your core systems. Um, and um, as I will get to, in our use case, we actually, we went uh, with pretty unique integration as well. And we were really, really happy that we were ultimately uh, very much able to um, accomplish that. And now actually uh, to uh, the use case at question, which is a um, large Canadian telecommunications firm. And I know I'm being very coy and not uh, discussing the particular client name. Um, I am very much aware that, um, you know, um, there is a fairly short list of which client it can be. And I will leave it up to the audience to, um, um, to connect the dots. Uh, but uh, so the client is one of Canada's top three tel telecommunications providers. Um, some of the challenges that the client was experiencing in, a, uh, in their contact center uh, were as follows. So first of all, there was a lot of manual work that was required to manage day-to-day -day operations, um, a lot of swivel chair activities to move data from one system to another. Second one is re really large swings in demand due to seasonality, um, putting stress on workforce. Um, as we all know, uh, especially during uh, the beginning and throughout the pandemic, all of contact centers have seen really high uh, surges in demand in this particular case. And ultimately in the process we chose because it was related to customer moves. Um, and as we know, um, people have moved quite a bit and quite more than usual during the pandemic, again, that created additional demand. And of course, as it is a contact center, there were challenges in responding efficiently to customers and resolving issues on first call. So that's called FCR. And um, there was a lot of um, customer frustrations that were leading to churn. Um, important to note as well that our, uh, so I will talk about our approach uh, that we took uh, as well and uh, what the outcomes were in the use case. So uh, important to set the stage is that we actually have been working with this client for a really long time. Um, we uh, have designed and built an internal automation center of excellence for them. That work has been ongoing for several years. Um, before embarking on contact center of automation, we led the implementation of their automation solutions across uh, multiple business areas that included marketing, um, operations and provisions processing, a technical service, but of course, uh, primarily focused on very uh, typical back office operations. And uh, we have done in total at this point, eight years of continuous sustainment and thought leadership to support their automation program. Um, they started really small, uh, only a couple of developers on their side and us training their resources. Today, there are over 40 resources that are a part of their core automation team. They're consistently growing. 
um, a ton of processes in production, a really big process in production too, uh, with um, hundreds and thousands of annual transactions um, uh, being consistently processed. And now, of course, higher this stage as well. And on the right hand side is a little pyramid and uh, this is a core of what we delivered. So it's their automation strategy supported by governance and change management. Um, and um, for the delivery side, it is of course, helping them continue to identify the right processes to automate people uh, to have and to train and the right tools uh, to accomplish the tasks. And now how we actually implemented services is. So five-step process uh, really and um, First came the contact center automation assessment, so trying uh, to determine what to do, process scope selection, uh, technical uh, technique selection, so uh, we have chosen service assist, solution design development ex and execution, and of course, uh, training. So for the assessment, uh, we conducted it to determine the right pilot process to automate that could be a foundation of future work for the client COE. Uh, for the process scope selection, uh, because um, I, I suppose the um, nature of contact center is not, you don't automate a single process, you automate specific client queues. So we selected a very high volume contact center queue. Uh, it was called Move Valet, so it's uh, customer moves um, and associated items uh, that need to be done uh, with th three specific workflows within that queue uh, for scope of automation. Uh, so this was the first North American enterprise scale implementation of service assist. Um, so this client already um, utilizes Blue Prism as the product of choice for automation. And when uh, service assist became available um, at its uh, really strong enterprise scale, uh, it has been evaluated for quite uh, a while to make sure that um, we had the right process, the right business case for the process, and that uh, service assist is the right tool to accomplish it and was. Um, and then we impl uh, implemented um, service assist in a manner that was quite customized uh, to seamlessly integrate within client systems and technologies in place. Um, and it was put into production within six months. Um, and finally, we trained clients automation developers in service assist, uh, as well as oversaw the identification and development of more service assist use cases. And of course, that work is ongoing today as well. Um, it was interesting too. Uh, so when it came to opportunity identification, uh, so our client had a lot of questions of, well, should we actually be using service assist? Should we use uh, standard RPA? We're not convinced that service assist is the way to go. Um, so uh, we worked with a client to, um, and trained the client uh, kind of in critical thinking of what's the right tool uh, for the job for them. And it really boils down to a few key decision point. One um, is the work you're doing in contact center. So, and let's take care of the yes, the left-hand side of the decision tree first. So it's in contact center, chances are service assist is the more suitable to do it uh, due to uh, the features that allow to process high volume um, high frequency, uh, fast SLA work. So if it's high volume, yes, you still should do, use service assist. And if you have really unforgiving near instantaneous SLA, yes, please use service assist. Um, and if you're not in contact center, there's a few options of what you can do, but really if you still rely on two-way communication, so sending a response to a bot and getting it back to you in the loop, um, we still recommend if it's a yes, you may still want to use service assist even if it's not in a contact center environment, but contact central like um, interaction. And if it's a no, there, then there are a few options. You can still have human in the loop, uh, human triggered process using web triggers, or if it's a no, you can utilize a standard Blue Prism bot. Um, so um, our client uses this methodology today to continue evaluating uh, future cases and kind of where and how to implement uh, their multiple and disparate automation opportunities. Um, we then uh, conducted opportunity assessment, a four-step approach with identifying goals, capturing data, conducting process assessment, prioritizing opportunities and preparing business cases, and then having a roadmap for how they will be delivered. And of course, initially we chose the first um, proof of concept, but a major proof of concept uh, project and are continuing to build uh, the delivery roadmap for this client. 
In terms of how we actually um, used service assist uh, to achieve the goal. And so I have mentioned, so uh, the process we chose was a move valet queue in which there were three components. It's seasonal suspension. So suspending a client ser or service for a portion of time. Th a third, uh, second one was a case manager check. Uh, so um, checking whether or not uh, a case manager is already assigned to the account and single view notes, which is specific notes that a uh, frontline employee needs to take during the process. Um, we had a challenge that a client already had a really major integration of how um, their frontline employees were doing their tasks. They had their own frontline employee interface, which connected to, um, to backend applications and data. And uh, the client made it very specific that they did not want to utilize native service assist, um, so front end user interface and functionality, but rather they wanted to uh, use their own. So uh, three things needed to get uh, developed um, to connect service assist to client application. That was the development of a drop zone, listener and uh, utilization of REST APIs. So this definitely went a little bit beyond of standard Blue Prism RPA development. Um, but was very efficient and uh, fruitful and, and of course impactful ultimately for the client. Um, now I will get to talking uh, to the impact that we actually uh, saw and uh, we'll focus on five areas because they're the most um, easy to quantify and identify and this is what we quickly saw um, in weeks and months um, after our implementation. So as we what? mentioned, this, um, <clears throat> Over a period of six months, um, implemented, put in place, uh, volumes were ramped up to production and age frontline employees were using the process uh, consistently. So first one was average handle time reductions. Uh, for the three queues that we selected, average handle time was reduced by 90%, which was um, in a sense, shocking for us to see because when we initially made the estimates of what we think, what we will say, they were, of course, a little bit more conservative. So one of the processes was reduced from 200 seconds to 26 seconds, which is 87%. Second workflow um, reduced from 52 to uh, 10 seconds, which was 81% reduction. And third one actually went from 42 to zero seconds, 100% reduction. So what we mean by that is um, a frontline employee did not need to perform that action altogether. So we designed it in a fire and forget manner. So query was sent through service assist uh, for the bots to process and it was done. Um, so of course, huge impact just from average handle time, which is one of the key metrics, of course, in contact centers. Second one was uh, employee satisfaction. So measurably what we did see is a 30% uh, reduction of agent attrition. And what um, it is attributed to, and uh, this is what the client has shared with us, this was due to a newly simplified workflow that uh, helped the FLRAN line employees so much that um, it really reduced employee churn. From what we've seen immediately, they were super excited to use it because it was simple. It integrated with how they already were doing work and just reduced the number of uh, swivel chair activities that they were doing. Um, of course, related uh, to employee satisfaction and related to average handle time reduction is customer experience. Um, so um, a little bit harder to measure right away after implementation, but of course, something that we're con continuing to gather data on. But uh, saved average handle time allowed the frontline employees to spend more time performing more high value queries with their customers, and that improves customer experience. Um, um, another measurable metric that we did see was OPEX or operating expenses uh, reductions as well as organizational buy-in. So there was a reduction of 30 to 40% of OPEX. Um, and uh, what we also have seen is because realized benefits were in excess of original pro projections. So as an example, average handle time was more reduced than it thought it would be. It really helped build organizational buy-in and excitement that not just RPA program that has been in place for years is great and we should continue doing that, but this new thing we're doing with contact center automation is excellent. There is a strong use case, really high performance, and we should continue doing it. And of course, measurable result there is that client is actively pursuing more contact center automation work and cases. 
And of course, finally, um, it's the recognition. So the client won 2021 Pinnacle Award at Blue Prism Customer Excellence Award. Um, I am sure they're very happy about it. It's a lot of um, positive exposure and positive uh, messaging, both about uh, the capability of contact center automation and service assist and what this particular client could do. Um, this approach is innovative. Um, as I mentioned, it's the first time this is done at an enterprise scale in North America. And uh, of course, what a great thing that that happens uh, in Canada um, as well. Um, I think um, that's, that's kind of like the key message that I wanted uh, to take away for the use case I believe we do have quite ample time today uh, for a Q&A if there are questions. And I also wanted to note that um, if you do have questions for me or for Dave, either about Bernie Group or this use case, or you want to hear a little bit more from us about services, please uh, feel free uh, to reach out. So I'll stop right now and kind of turn it over for uh, the rest of everyone uh, for any questions that you might have. Hey, Jenny, I was interested in uh, like, obviously there's a lot of different chat solutions and what was the the, the uh, kind of decision tree with regard to going with Surface Assist compared to, um, you know, there's, you know, I know there's teams and kind of, you know, ServiceNow has a, has a function and all these other providers. Yeah, I, so there were actually, so for decision tree, of course, I presented something a little bit more uh, simplified and uh, how we did it, but that's of course not the few, uh, full story. Um, yeah. There's a few aspects of it for the client that uh, went into play. One is of course was strength of the business case. And um, uh, secondly, uh, the fact that um, it is an existing Blue Prism client. So there are of course synergies with um, importantly, with uh, processes that were already built in place from back office perspective. So uh, the ease of leveraging previously built automation and built on uh, onto it, it's related to that is leveraging in-house expertise with a particular set of tools and excitement to continue learning more. Um, and a few important things is uh, simplicity with integration with the technologies that has been invested on already, right? So um, if service assist went out and said, hey, this application that you're using right now for employees, we just can't do it. You have to use our interface. Uh, I think the answer in the story would already be quite different. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was part of the reason. And uh, importantly, um, the client and we, of course, were really impressed by uh, the capability to address um, contact center queries in a really timely manner. Um, and that's the biggest thing, because um, if in a contact center environment, you can't answer a customer query right away, and uh, if you don't see that instantaneous output and you see errors and uh, queues are building up, there is it's an impossible, um, I suppose, uh, mountain to climb, and uh, Service Assist really successfully kind of um, addressed uh, those all of those challenges. Mm -hmm. And I guess integrating with the front end. Uh, and then triggering the automations in the back end, it, it's effectively act, acting as a message broker between the. That's exactly uh, it. Yeah. So, well, uh, you know, from just a general automation and workflow uh, perspective, of course, there are tools out there can, uh, that can accomplish the task. But um, I think all of those reasons uh, survive, continued pointing uh, to uh, service assist. Mm -hmm. Daniel? And can I jump in? Not, not on how on the decision tree, of course, for that, but, you know, just to kind of, uh, you know, one of the things that was asked about how is service assist, I guess, compared to say ServiceNow or Salesforce or some of the other, some of the other solutions on, uh, in the TAP ecosystem. And would it be okay if I jump in and just talk to that? Of course, absolutely. All right, great. So I'm going to get on video. For those who don't know me, I am Elisa. Elisa, really quick. I think your audio might be a little... Oh, okay. Is this any better? Oh, it's this is better. better. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I so, audio right up. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll, I'll not be on, on video. Sorry. I'm having some computer issues, but um, nice to meet y'all. I'm Elisa DeSasso. I'm director of contact center solutions. Um, and really, we work with great partners like the Bernie Group to help bring services to the market. 
And one of the things I just wanted to talk about is there are a ton of contact center solutions out there. Um, we have them on the TAP ecosystem, and you'll see them in the contact centers, Genesis, Avaya, you know, backend, Salesforce, ServiceNow. What we're doing is we're that enabling technology that brings all of these disparate solutions together. So it, we're not us, you know, Blue Prism Service Assist versus any of the existing contact center solutions. What we're doing is bringing automation to make them smarter, better, more efficient, driving, you know, all the things that Jen, you talked about with this customer, um, we're able to do lower average handle time, better customer experience by bringing all of these systems together. Hope that helped answer from not on the decision tree, but kind of where this would fit with the other. Yeah. Thanks, Elisa. In the contact center. Thank you. And I see uh, James. I think you had have your hand up as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I've, I do have a question, but I just wanted to just add as well to uh, Elisa and I. Obviously, work very closely together. But um, but just to add, you know, sort of the philosophy as well here is that if you've got lots of different systems, so you've got chat. And it's over here and it's in its own little silo and you've got another channel over here which is i don't know your email or even facebook or something like that you need a consistent process that combines them so that you've got consistent customer experience across all channels and that's something that we're finding when we talk to people um they they can do using rpa but they can't do via other tools because you need something that is the master process that sits in the middle of all of those things and orchestrates them. Um, so my, my, my question was actually, you know, they, these are all great results, um, especially the OPEX stuff. Uh, I was just very curious to find out what the sort of ROI case is in terms of how quickly it's, it's projected to pay itself off. Sorry, um, what was, um, um, could you repeat your uh, final question? You cut off for a second. Oh, did I? Sorry. Yeah, I, I was just, uh, I was interested to, to know um, how, how quickly the ROI uh, is expected to, to be achieved. Um, obviously, you know, again, one of the, one of the sort of big messages here is that traditional IT projects um, in the contact center are huge. And you mentioned that this took six months. They take years because you're pulling up, you're ripping up infrastructure. Um, in order to in order to get the results that you want. Whereas this, um, so I think understanding the uh, contact set to change project would be really interesting. Yeah. Um it's it's a really good question. So um, I personally I don't have really ready at my fingertips um, data on uh, their current ROI. I know that um, um, it, it clearly it was really successful for the client internally as they did uh, take quite a few steps uh, to continue selling the business case uh, for uh, more service assist work, and uh, it ended up uh, you know going through their internal gates quite successfully over the period of. Uh, uh, 2021, and uh, that is what led to the decision to continue and expand um, on their contact center work. Um, I think um, that one, um, I perhaps will leave uh, to the next discussion that I have on this particular use case, unless, uh, Dave, you have yeah, kind of like yeah, I, more information. Yeah, I mean, without getting into too many specifics, it paid off within a year. So one of the things that our clients frequently inquire about is, well, if we make the investment, can it, can it be self-funding? And the answer is, <clears throat> um, you know, it, of course it depends a little bit, but in this case, yes, um, you know, paid back uh, in year. And so, you know, the, the time it takes to implement, see the results and start to see impact um, is very fast relative to some of the bigger, you know, IT projects you might be used to. Thank you, Dave. What other types of use cases have you guys seen? Uh, and I, I guess that's kind of a broad question to anyone in the, in the call. Um, you know, is there other kind of chatbot uh, projects that people are working on? It's actually, um, uh, so right now, the same client is currently investigating um, Kind of broadening the scope of their contact center work and what they can use service assist for. So right now they are in really early stages of exploration um, of more 
omni-channel um, integration and IVR integration. So that's actually something I'm super excited about because um, it sounds really cool. Mm -hmm. And um, I think like, as we mentioned earlier, IVR integration can kind of fully change um, how customer is interacting uh, with the contact center in some cases, uh, fully avoiding certain flows. So um, as this year continues, we are very, very excited uh, to see that with the client. That's great. And allows the customer to kind of communicate the, the, the way that yeah, they absolutely. Yeah. 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 No, that's, that's neat. Great. Anyone else in the call uh, working on any other job pop projects or looking into any research uh, into that area? Hey, Jesse, this is Andre. Can you hear me? I sure can. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not necessarily working on, on that particularly, but a question I do have, and I may have missed this. Mm -hmm. uh, Jenia and, and David, but uh, having run large contact centers for governments in the past life, in one of my past lives, I, I wonder how uh, the agents receive this uh, technology, and um, you know what feedback have you gotten from from agents with respect to how this is supporting their their work and and helping the augment what they can do. Yeah, um, good question. Yeah, so. Uh, what we measurably have seen um, ourselves is really immediate excitement from the agents. Um, what we've seen in the past with RPA, um, in some situations, it, it can take, it take a little bit of time to uh, kind of sell it internally and to build excitement that, oh, automation is coming. It's a little bit odd. Is my job um, under risk? With contact center automation, we have seen quite the opposite. It was really immediately jumping on the fact that there's, hey, new simplified workflow, it's easier for me to actually do what I'm here to do, which is talk to my customer, um, as opposed to updating all of the systems all at once. Uh, immediate feedback from agents was verbally and to our team, very, very happy right away. What we did see and what the client has shared with us is over the period of implementation, so over the period of 2021, there has been a 30% reduction in um, agent attrition attributed uh, to the implementation of automation. And if you think about a contact center, it's a it's a pretty, uh, it's a tough job, right? You're speaking with customers frequently who are unhappy, who have had a problem, who have an issue. Mm -hmm. um, by being able to address those uh, problems and getting to first call resolution, uh, right. Being able to resolve those issues on the call immediately just makes for such a better work environment um, because the customers leave being much happier. So your first call resolution improves, your net promoter score improves, and for age, for front frontline employees, it makes their day better because they're able to, you know, serve their customers more effectively. So it's a, it's a it's a huge win. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. That's important. What are the different ways that the, the actual contact center staff can interact with the um, with the tool? Like obviously, you know, there's you know, you can trigger automation. So naturally, the email functionality you can you can have it front ended through a web some type of a website, I guess, and manage the workflow. So, um, and and I guess you could probably integrate it with almost most of the other standard chat tools as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in this particular case, so um, um, it was not only kind of like integrating with backend systems, but uh, the way that um, the client applications and their, their typical uh, workflow and script were, they did not change at all. Um, literally, what they did see is the interface they've always had, which uh -huh. was a big win as well, because it affects uh, the training, um, how, how they interact with the system. And of course, the client has put a lot of thought to the system that they've built. Um, that was uh, one really kind of selling point uh, for the client for service assist, but there's a few ways. Um, so uh, service assist can uh, mimic the client systems and you can develop um, a unified desktop. So um, quite a few options uh, to integrate. So either into the existing systems fully or develop something new, um, a little bit more uh, service assist uh, focused. That's great. And uh, kind of shifting over to James, and, and uh, we didn't really introduce you, James. James is actually the product owner of Service Assist. Um, is there any other kind of future integrations? And can you kind of go through your, your plan to integrate, to allow people to um, interact with Service Assist? 
Yeah, sure. Yeah. And in fact, we've actually we've actually got some really, really um, cool stuff underway um, with what we call our starter packs. So we tend not to go uh, go hard on sort of pushing starter packs as a thing. But the whole idea is that if you're new to this, there's a starting point here, which has got a load of templates for some of the most standard things that you see in a contact center. So change of address, for example, or a basic IVR integration. And the idea is that that's a starting point, which in principle will take out, you know, a lot of the build work, but it's also potentially a learning resource. So if you just wanted to get your hands on a service exist and understand how it works, we've got those components. Now at the moment, it, it's still kind of early stages and we're still we're still working on it a little bit there are there are a few select partners that we've been working with um, just to trial it out uh, as an early stage release but come uh, come the next release which is which is due sort of q2 this year um, we're hoping to make a bigger splash and possibly make those assets available via the dx um, and like i say it's about it's about this idea of getting closer to uh, a standard way of doing things for service assist because that way you know everyone in in these kind kinds of communities can learn from each other and say this is how i solved this problem oh that's a great idea let's let's update the standard way of doing it because that's better um, and it just helps with that learning curve i think the starter packs are probably the 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 thing that excites me most at the moment what we're doing with service assist but obviously you know each each version we come up with new features um the the next version that's coming out is a uh, ground up actually uh, which is even easier to use um so uh yeah this, there is there is some stuff coming i need to keep it a little bit under wraps because it's still a few months away but... <laughs> we're in the corner of silence here james <laughs> <laughs> i mean those those of you those of you who um who, who um you know are on the um on the LMS, uh, the, the uh, BPU, there are obviously the What's New webinars. We had to delay the previous version, um, and it's a lot of what's in that previous What's New session where we, we talked about what's going to be coming up. It's going to be what's in this, this next version. Uh, it's just slightly delayed, sadly. All right, thank you. And Good. Go ahead. Jenny. I did see a question that came to me from Vinod. Um, so okay. Vinod is working uh, in intelligent network and is handling uh, SMSC. And uh, his question was, is that he wants to know what measures um, um, would I take in case of the emergency or a technical issue to restore services and how much time it will take to, to go back to normal. And I think perhaps it's a question a little bit for me and a little bit for uh, James and uh, service assist team. So, in the case of our client, um, quite a lot of work went uh, do the, uh, during the solution stage uh, to first of all, test the solution and make sure that infrastructure is set up in a high availability uh, manner and uh, that uh, we had both on the process build side and infrastructure wise um, kind of measures in place to make sure that um, if the bots are down or the environment down, it can be one noticed really quickly and two addressed in a timely manner. Uh, but uh, James, um, perhaps a question for you: What can services do to, you know, to have a good, strong resiliency? Sure. So I mean, it's a difficult one because service assist, as it stands now, is an on-prem piece of software. So so as a result, a lot of the things around resilience are based around the way that you set up your infrastructure, um, such as having having the um, uh, load balances and things like that set up in place, and obviously making sure that you've got the right sizing available. Um, there was there was some feedback uh, from Bernie Group on this, which which we're actioning as well to make sure that we're a lot clearer about what those what those specs are that that we would recommend as a minimum. Um, but in terms of what's in the product itself and the way that you configure it, the, the main thing to remember is that the, the more complex your processes are, the more load you're going to put on, uh, on, on, on everything that's in there. So um, we recommend that you sort of break things down a little bit rather than having a big monolith of a process where you've got everything built into one master. You actually look at how you can break things down a little bit. And that, you know, we've, we've seen that that's, that's got a benefit on, on things like caching, for instance. Um, there, there are, uh, I'd, need, I'd need to remind myself um, exactly what's in it, but there are also changes again in this, in this later version that's coming up uh, in terms of things like the way that it caches data so that it, it, it puts less load on the memory. Um, and, and that's that will also make a difference there. Bless you. <laughs> Great.
Great. Okay, any other questions? You can put them in the chat or you can you can ask them verbally. It's up to you. Hello, Jesse, can you hear me? Sure can, even hey, hey, not. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I am in, uh, working in India and uh, at the time of emergency or technical issue, uh, we uh, uh, um, we work on our uh, and from DR side, we keep up the system very early. Uh, is there any concept in Canada like this? We are, uh, having an issue on the main side, then you keep up from the DR side. That is disaster recovery side. In India, we make uh, we work on simultaneously on both sides. In case of any technical issue, we work on DR side to keep up the system and uh, to prevent the loss of customer and the company. I think to your point, I mean, it's really important that your DR side is synchronized. And so I think it depends on your technology architecture. Um, and ideally, your, your database would be synchronized to your DR site like potentially even using storage uh, uh, replication. Uh, but in some cases you can use, uh, you know, uh, certainly uh, the databases often have synchronization capabilities in them, but to your point, absolutely. The DR site needs to be synchronized. Yeah. Yeah. In that case, we take routine backup. In, uh, to prevent such situation, we take routine backup and uh, routine health check. Uh, check up and uh, in case we feel any problem, then keep it sorted out, sort out and uh, no time. Yeah, backups are great, but they take a long time to bring back and to restore. So yeah, typically large enterprise, you want to make sure that you synchronize the data and at least you have the data in two, two sites. And at that point, if you need to spin up infrastructure, uh, the, the server side and whatnot, um, it's, it's faster. But yeah, that's a really good point for sure. Right. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Great. All right. Well, we're uh, we're coming to a close here. Um, and uh, yeah, another question here: Is there any other, or is there any, here? Sorry, I, I didn't have my chat open, so I'm kind of reading from the bubble. Just want to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, is there any Blue Prism process flow examples uh, where I can understand how Service Assist helps with the uh, uh, concerned call center agents when they receive a call from the customer? And James, I guess this goes to your point of having yeah. a, a toolkit, say. Eh? Yeah, so so that's exactly what we're we're aiming to do with the starter packs. I mean, just just to tell you what the starter packs are exactly. As I say, they're, they're templates uh, in in Blue Prism language. That's a combination of BP release files, VBOs. There are actually also some machine image templates there as well for uh, for certain environments. Um, so you've you've got all of the sizing built into it, and uh, and the I uh, I don't. I, can't remember off the top of my head the exact examples, but what they what they go through is the sort of starting process of customer ringing up, um, how they go through the IVR roughly. Um, you, there's you know there'll still be gaps where you need to say right it needs to interact with this particular IVR in a particular way, but we've we've built the stuff around it. And the important thing is that what we've seen previously is that we've had a lot of people who've tried to implement Service Assist. Um, thinking that they they understand service assist because they've been through blue prism uh training and that's not that's not necessarily the case um because there are certain quirks around implementing service assist that you, you know you do need to have some knowledge on and it's that gap that we're trying to fill with with these templates so the, these templates they've got we've got some skeletons that we're calling them now those skeletons don't actually then they're, they're not any particular addressable use case you know it doesn't deal with um, you know, how do I manage a claim, for example? It's just, here is how you interact with the service assist queue in this specific instance. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is that you can then piece all of those together. And in principle, at the end, you've got the building blocks there to build whatever process that you, you want and be relatively sure that that's probably the best way of doing it. Great. I did put the uh, service assist uh, link uh, just to the product page uh, on the portal. So that's a good source. It's got a whole bunch of you know, install guides and user UI stuff and the Blue Prism training, like you mentioned, and there's a community. Uh, go ahead, Alyssa. Yeah. And in addition to that, so we, from a pre-built configurable templates and processes, James mentioned that, but we do have some, if you want just process flow examples, you can use tools that you 
we do actually have some of those. Jesse, I don't have access to them right now, but if I want to send them out, is there somewhere? Is it on the user group? Or yeah, if you um, if you share an email address or something like that, I'd be happy to, to share it out with the group for sure. Okay, awesome. Yeah. I'll do that. Thank you so much. All right, thank so, you. And those do give you some more visuals on kind of what are those displays look like. Um, they, they're they not necessarily pre, pre integrated in yet or pre developed, but they are some of the user. Great. Okay, good. All right, well, we're, uh, we're coming to a close um, and uh, the next session is in on February the 17th at 9 a.m. Um, ATV is doing an interesting presentation on how they freed up um, a ton of capacity in uh, the Alberta Treasury Branch uh, organization. Looking forward to that from uh, from uh, Yanka. And uh, yeah, definitely want to thanks Jenny, Jenny and, uh, and Dave uh, for, for this presentation and, uh, and thanks James for attending. Uh, it's great to have such such a high quality uh, presenter. So thank you. Thanks, thank Jesse. You. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, All right. everyone. All right. Till the next time. Bye Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Bye.